<laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Jerry Leiter. And I'm Chad Leiter. And we would like to welcome you to today's edition of the worship service at Christ United Methodist Church. Like you, we've been staying home, quarantining, doing the best we can to get through this trying these trying times. And we have noticed God at work in a number of different ways. One big way that I have noticed is that the opportunity to connect with all of our family that is so far away has been more frequent, more often, and it has been a, a blessing to us to be able to communicate with them since everyone has more time. And we've also noticed God's blessing in a recent trip we took. We traveled in our RV across the country. Our destination was South Dakota. We were in awe of the farmlands that we drove by, the vastness of the sky, and the cherry on top were the Badlands and Black Hills of South Dakota. They were absolutely stunning. The colors, the sandstone, the trees, the sky, it was all just beautiful. And every day we thanked God for the beauty of his creation. So as we enter into our time of worship, pull up a couch, pull up your camping chair, pull up a log, <laughs> and enjoy worship with us today. Thank you and God bless. Bye-bye. Come away with me to a quiet place Apart from the world and its frantic pace To pray, reflect, and seek God's grace Welcome to Story Camp. I'm Pastor Carrie. Uh, we are reading The Wind and the Willows, and this week we are on chapter four. Um, if you remember, we left Rat and Molly uh, last week, uh, chapter three, uh, lost out in the wild wood in the snow, um, and in their search for a safe place to spend the night, um, they just happened upon the doormat. Uh, that was lying outside of Mr. Badger's home. And so they had dug and scraped uh, to get to the door. And uh, when we left them last chapter, 
they had just begun banging and knocking on the door, ringing the doorbell to get Badger's attention. So here we are. Um, I'm actually in my living room or my dining room, uh, but um, we're in the dark because this uh, week's chapter uh, takes place deep inside um, uh, Mr. Badger's home, his tunnels underground uh, where it's dark. Uh, so let's begin chapter four, Mr. Badger. There was a noise of a bolt pushed back and the door opened a few inches, enough to show a long snout and a pair of sleepy blinking eyes. <laughs> oh, Badger, cried the rat. Let us in, please. It's me, Rat, and my friend Mole, and we've lost our way in the snow. What, Ratty, my dear little man, exclaimed the badger. Come along in, both of you, both of you at once. The two animals tumbled over each other in their eagerness to get inside and heard the door shut behind them with great joy and relief. Come into the kitchen. There's a first-rate fire there and supper and everything, said Badger. He shuffled on in front of them, carrying a lantern, and they followed. They followed through dark, long, tunnel-like passages until they found themselves in all the glow and warmth of a large, lit kitchen. The kindly badger set out cushions for them to sit on while they warmed themselves in front of the fire. When at last they were thoroughly toasted, the badger summoned them to the table where he had been busy setting out a lovely supper. While Mole and, at, and Rat ate, Badger sat in the armchair at the head of the table and nodded gravely at intervals as the animals told them their story. And he did not seem surprised or shocked at anything. And he never said, I told you so, or just what I always said, or remarked that they ought to have done so-and-so, or ought not to have done something else, the mole began to feel very kindly towards Badger. Now then, Badger continued, tell us the news from your part of the world. How's my old friend Toad doing? Oh, from bad to worse, said the rat gravely. Another smash up only last week and a bad one. You see, he will insist on driving himself and he's hopelessly incapable. He's been in the hospital three times, added the mole. And as for the fines he's had to pay, oh, it's just simply awful to think about. Badger went through a bit of hard thinking. Hmm. Now look here, he said at last. We, that is you and me and our friend the mole here, we'll have to take Toad seriously in hand. We'll stand no more of his nonsense whatsoever. We'll bring him back to reason. We'll make our friend be a sensible Toad. Now, that's enough of Toad. It's time we were all in bed, said the badger, getting up and fetching extra lanterns. Come along, you two. I'll show you your quarters and take your time tomorrow morning. Breakfast is at any hour you please. In accordance with the kindly badger's instructions, the two tired animals came down to breakfast very late the next morning and found a bright fire burning in the kitchen. Where's Mr. Badger, inquired the mole as he warmed the coffee pot before the fire. Rat well knew that Badger, having eaten a hearty breakfast, had retired to his study and set, settled himself in an armchair with his legs up on another chair and a red cotton handkerchief over his face and was being busy in the usual way at this time of the year for animals that take winter naps. Later that day, the front doorbell clanged loudly and the rat went to see who it might be. Presently, he returned in front of the otter who greeted 
both of them kindly. Thought I might find you here all right, said the otter cheerfully. They were all in a great state of alarm along the river bank when I arrived this morning. Rat never been home all night, nor mole either. Something dreadful must have happened, they said. And the snow had covered up all your tracks, of course. But I knew that when people were in any fix, they mostly went to Badger, or else Badger got to know of it somehow. So I came straight off here through the wild wood and the snow. Soon after Otter's arrival, Badger returned from his study and they all sat down to lunch together. The mole found himself placed next to Mr. Badger, and as the other two were still deep in river talk from which nothing could divert them, he took the opportunity to tell Badger how comfortable and homelike it all felt to him. Once well underground, he said, you know exactly where you are. Nothing can happen to you and nothing can get at you. Things go on all the same overhead and you let them and don't bother about them. When you want to, up you go. And there the things are waiting for you. The badger simply beamed at him. That's exactly what I say, he replied. There's no peace, no tranquility except underground. And then if your ideas get larger and you want to expand, why? Simply dig and scrape and there you are. And on the other hand, if you feel your house is a bit too big, you stop up a hole or two and there you are again. When lunch is over, he continued, I'll take you all around this little place of mine. I can see you'll appreciate it. You understand what domestic architecture ought to be. After lunch, accordingly, when the other two had settled themselves into the chimney corner and had started a he heated argument on the subject of eels, <laughs> the badger lighted a lantern and asked the mole to follow him. After much exploring, they made their way back to the kitchen where they found the rat walking up and down, very restless. The underground atmosphere was oppressing him and getting on his nerves, and he seemed really to be afraid that the river would run away if he wasn't there to look after it. So he had his overcoat on. Come along, Mole, he said anxiously as soon as he caught sight of them. We must get off while it's daylight. Don't want to spend another night in the wild wood. You really needn't fret, Ratty, added the badger placidly. My passages run further than you think, and I've paths to the edge of the wood in several directions. The otter, knowing all the paths, took charge of the party as they trailed out and made swiftly for home, for firelight and the familiar things it played on, for the voice sounding cheerily outside their window of the river that they knew and trusted. All right, chapter four. Let's take a few minutes to think about what we've read before we head out. Uh, first off, let's think about the kingdom of God. We've talked about how uh, in this story, The Wind and the Willows, uh, we really see uh, what friendship is all about. We really see that uh, what friendship inside of the kingdom of God is supposed to like look like. We've talked about loyalty and faithfulness to our friends. We've talked about rescuing, helping out our friends, even when it's not easy for us, even when it's going to cost us something. Um, and uh, in this chapter, we see um, another um, aspect of friendship. Two things I want to point out, um, and they have to do with Badger. He came inside into Badger's home. Badger didn't say, hey, I told you so. Uh, instead, he just listened. He listened to their story. He nodded. He was kind. He was gracious. He just listened. That's such an important part of friendship, isn't it? To just be listened to, to be able to tell each other um, our stories um, and just have someone listen. It's such an important part of friendship in the kingdom of God. Uh, God is such a good listener to us, isn't he? Um, another uh, point I wanted to make, uh, again, with Badger, 
was when Badger asked Mole and Rat uh, later on when they were sitting by the fire warming up, he asked them about his friend Toad. And Roll, Molly and Ratty were honest. They told him that um, Toad was still being pretty naughty with his motor car. Um, in fact, that he'd um, had a bunch of smash ups, that he'd ended up in the hospital, and that he'd been given lots of fines by the police officers. Uh, Badger didn't make fun of Toad. Um, he didn't say naughty things about Toad. He just said, okay, friends. Uh, we're going to have to love Toad enough to tell him the truth um, because he wanted Toad uh, to be transformed. He wanted Toad to do better. Um, and so he was willing um, to have maybe a hard conversation with Toad to help Toad maybe see the truth, um, accept the truth, and live the truth. Uh, so those are important parts of friendship, listening and telling each other the truth, loving each other enough to tell each other the truth. All right, let's think about our homes. Let's think about the idea of our home. Um, Badger uh, certainly was generous with his home, wasn't he? He welcomed uh, Mole and Ratty right in. Um, was eager to get them warmed up by the fire, eager to uh, set out some good food for them, eager to give them a place to rest and to sleep, uh, eager to listen, um, eager to hear their stories. And that's um, such a great example of what our home should be like too. Um, just ready to welcome folks in, uh, ready to offer a meal, ready to offer a place to sleep, um, ready to listen. Uh, our homes um, and nature. We've been talking about nature. Now this is a little bit different, isn't it? This time we're underground inside the earth in these tunnels that Badger has made uh, his home in. And um, we see that Ratty doesn't really like being underground. He misses the river. Uh, he's a river rat, but that Mole is actually quite comfortable. It's, um, I think, reminding him of his home. If you remember when we first met him in chapter one, he was in his home underground doing some spring cleaning. Um, so the earth, the earth, um, and uh, Badger and Mole seem to agree that it makes them feel very safe. Finally, um, transformation. And we've been using the book of Psalms as um, a way to receive God's transformative um, good news for us uh, as we've re read through um, the wind and the willows. And today I want to read for you from Psalm 62, Psalm 62, verse 1 and 2. Truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. And um, I think today, uh, Badger and his home were a good example. Mole and Rat were pretty shaken. They were afraid. Uh, they were lost out in the wild wood. And uh, Badger opened the door of his home and welcomed them in. Uh, welcomed them into the safety uh, and the warmth and the comfort of his home underground. Um, and uh, I think that that's an example to us of uh, this passage um, where truly our souls find rest in God and Mole and Rat truly found rest uh, from the wild wood in Badger's home and with Badger. All right, that's all for now. Have a great week. Know that you're loved and that you're prayed for. Oh, and there's Kitty. <laughs> bye bye. One, two, oh, one, two, three, four. Oh.
These psalms were designed to help the disciple prepare their hearts and their minds for worship. So far, we've talked about a few godly traits. First, perseverance. We said that perseverance describes an intentional life focused on taking that next step of faith as we move from today to the throne of God. Next, we talk about hope. Our hope is rooted in the work that Christ has already done for each of us. Hope, combined with expectation and trust, reveals Jesus at work among us. Then we talked about service. The disciples' life of service is described as living in the presence of God while reflecting God's glory in all that we do. Finally, last week we talked about happiness. The more we are in relationship with God, the more we realize God's role in our lives. Happiness occurs when we fulfill our purpose. This week, we're going to look at the Psalm of Help. So let's take a look at Psalm 124. If it had not been for the Lord who is on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been for the Lord who is on our side, when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers, and that snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. Now, grammatically, this psalm is structured just like Psalm 129, where we talked about perseverance. That should not be a surprise to us because perseverance and help kind of go hand in hand, if you will. Here's the truth that we know from these two psalms we know that without God, we would fail, right? God is the one who gives us strength for the journey, God is the one who gives us assurance when we fall short. And when we are in need, God is the one who comes to our rescue. So this psalm opens up with, if it had not been for the Lord who is on our side. Right? Clearly, the psalmist sets up the paradigm that the Lord is the change agent that gives his people success. If it had not been for the Lord, we wouldn't be here. If it would, had not been for the Lord, we wouldn't have hope. If it had not been for the Lord, we would know peace. But that's not it. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. You see, the psalmist clearly places trust in God. But we learn that was not always the case, right? From reading the scriptures, we know the truth in that statement. There are many times in our story about how we've turned away. It's even the core of our confessional statement, right? When we turned away and your love remained steadfast. The psalmist says, let Israel now say. So they must have had some experience where they did not include God in, in their goals kind of flopped, right? But now they have proof. Now they have a story to tell of how God redeemed their life. Let Israel now say, if the Lord had not been on our side. Friends, this is an important thing for us to notice, right? The most powerful tool that the disciple has in their toolbox is their story. 
right? Nobody has a story like yours. Nobody can discount or nullify your story, and nobody can take over your story. Why? Because it's your story. So why is your story so important? Well, because your story tells your relationship between you and God. It describes how God is a part of who you are. It reveals how God has helped you to weather the storm. And it gives hope to others who are struggling in similar situations. Although your story is unique, it shows God at work in your life in a way that others can relate to. So Psalm 124 for us becomes a testimonial story or a witness to God's work in Israel. Right? If the Lord had, been, had not been on our side... Let Israel now say, if the Lord had not been on our side. Right? It's a testimony to how God is at work to Israel. Notice God's help in the midst of their situation. If it had not been for the Lord when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed me up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Right here, they're talking about a battle. Perhaps it was a physical battle or a war, but those details aren't really important. What is important is that in the midst of the battle, God was there. If the Lord had not been on our side, we would have been swallowed up. But God was there. Right? If it had not been for the Lord, the battle would have been lost. It continues, it says, if it had not been for the Lord, then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters. Right? In their history, you had the story of Noah and the ark, right? There was Israel's escape from oppression through the Red Sea. In each of these situations, if it had not been for the Lord, then the Israelites would have been lost forever. Notice their that their testimonial story here is that if it had not been for the Lord, then we would have been lost. We, our people would be no more. That's it. Our nation would be wiped out. Our identity would be gone. If it had not been for the Lord, let Israel say, if it had not been for the Lord. You see, Israel needs to tell their story. Their story is not a private experience, but instead a corporate reality. This is who we are. If it had not been for the Lord, it would be game over. Do not pass go and do not collect $200. Sometimes I think it's that we have a hard time telling our story. Perhaps you can relate to that, right? We have a hard time telling our story. I'm not really sure why, whether it is a fear of judgment or a judgment upon our self-worth, but many disciples struggle to tell their own story. You see, not all stories are teacups and roses, and not all stories declare God's help in the same way. Some stories are mountaintop stories, and some stories are about trudging through the dark and lonely valleys. But no matter how your story is built, it is constructed in the same way, right? To show victory, we must describe the battle. To declare redemption, we must identify the shame. And in the end, we all win because God has already conquered the battle. One writer says that the psalmist is not a person talking about the good life, how God has kept them out of all difficulty. But instead, this person has gone through the worst and finds himself intact. Friends, that's hope, right? That's vision. That's trust. That's all the things that we've talked about in our Psalms up until this point. That writer continues, he says, There is no literature in all the world that is more true to life and more honest than the Psalms. For here we have a warts in all religion. Every skeptical thought, every disappointing venture, every pain, every despair that we can face is lived through and integrated into a personal saving relationship with God. A relationship that also has in it acts of praise, blessing, peace, security, trust, and love. You see, when we share that story... We declare the victory of God. When we share our story, we reclaim the reign of God's love in our lives. 
And when we share our story, we help others find proof that God really does love us and has a plan for our lives. If it had not been for the Lord, where would we be? Our psalm closes with the psalmist giving thanks for what the Lord has done, right? Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. You see, Christians are people who praise the God who is on our side. Christians are robust witnesses to the God who is our help. Christians are people who sing, oh, blessed be God, he didn't abandon us and leave us defenseless. You see, at Christ Church, our goal is not just to be Christians, but instead, Christian disciples. We are committed to taking that next step of faith. We are committed to being in relationship with Jesus Christ. We are committed to our journey of faith. We are committed to being led by the Holy Spirit. So what's the difference then between being a Christian and a Christian disciple? It's about intentionally inviting and receiving the love of God into our lives. It's about allowing God to transform us into a new thing, right? Sacrificing that old life, seeking God's plan, and putting God ever before us. It's about responding by sharing the story of what God has done and what God is doing now in your life. So it's about receiving God's love being transformed by God's love and responding by sharing the story of God's love in us today. The psalmist says this. He says, we have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. Right? This is God, our help. We once were lost, but now we are found. Right? God has been our help in ages past. I was blind, but now I see. I once was trapped in my own sin, but now God has helped me to escape. I have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The biblical stories here are numerous. Our testimonial stories here are numerous. The psalmist was trapped, but now has been set free. But there's more. He says that the snare... That thing that once held me tight, the snare is broken and we have escaped. You see, God doesn't just set us free, but the trap is broken. From a New Testament perspective, we should recognize this as the work of Christ, right? Death has been defeated, sin is no more, and forgiveness is at the core of our story. Friends, that's the story that we need to tell. I once was a sinner, but now I'm redeemed by grace. I once was lost in my own self, but now I have hope. When I was broken, I cried out to God and God answered. When I fall short, God is always there to carry me home. In the good times and in the rough times, I choose to look for God. God's blessing is mine because I said yes to Jesus. Although the hows, the whens, and the wheres may change in your story, the truth of God's story in our lives is always the same. God provides redemption and hope. God provides life. So the psalmist ends the psalm with this truth. He says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. Right? Right? He says that this is not just a God. This is not some arbitrary being, but the God who created all that is, all that was, and all that will ever be. That God, the one true God, loves you so much that he wants a deep, intimate, and personal relationship with you. Notice that. It's not some arbitrary being. It's not some another pagan God. But it's the one true God, the one who created all that is, all that was, and all that will ever be, loves you so much that he wants a deep, intimate, personal relationship because he cares about you. The God of the cosmos cares about you, your life, and your hope. So friends, as we close today, I invite you to pray these words with me from the hymn, God, Our Help in Ages Past. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. 
Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame, from everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, be thou our guide, while life shall last, and our eternal home. Amen. Friends, this next week of our coronavirus quarantine, I pray that you will continue to practice good, safe social distancing habits, and that you will care for one another from a distance. Please be sure to spend time with the prayer focus sheet, and remember to send in your tithe so that we can continue to do good work as God's people. Friends, be blessed. Amen. to bring you a blessing as worship has come to a close for today. Friends, there are important milestones we celebrated this week. Um, both Pastor Carrie and Aaron and Jessica and I each celebrated our anniversaries, our wedding anniversaries this week. So as we close worship today, I want to leave you with a traditional blessing out of the service of marriage out of the uh, United Methodist Church. And friends, this is a blessing for us too during quarantine time. May God the Eternal keep you in love with each other, so that the peace of Christ may abide in your home. Go and serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. Bear witness to the love of God in this world, 
so that those to whom love is a stranger will find in you generous friends. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Until we meet again next week, amen.